undergrad in the US and I went back to Pakistan. I joined a two room, I joined first the World Bank, but I didn't find the work fulfilling, so I quit. And I joined a startup. But I had no idea I'm joining a startup, let alone that I'm becoming an entrepreneur or a social entrepreneur. This was 1997 when these words were not so hip. I was passionate about an idea, the idea being giving micro loans to women so they could become economically strong and invest back in their families. We started from two small rooms. We started by going out in the communities, talking to the women, and what I realized was that we needed to start by building trust and by building confidence. The women did not really view themselves as business owners. They were running stores, they were doing trading, but in their mind, they were not really entrepreneurs. So we had to really start by building that confidence and the trust. I remember when we started, people said to us, this is not going to work. People will not, the women will not repay the money back. Secondly, you will not find female clients because they will not get uh, permission in a country like Pakistan to actually be part of the financial economy. Thirdly, we would not find female staff. So these were the three big challenges that we faced as soon as we started. And when we had 300 clients, we did a small strategic planning exercise and decided to think about the next five years. What could we achieve? So we came up with 4,000 clients. And from 300 clients, 4,000 seemed huge. That night, I could not sleep. I did not know what I had committed myself to and how I was going to achieve it. Within the same five years, we achieved 45,000 clients and became the first financially sustainable microfinance organization in the country and amongst the few globally. The work of our foundation, Kash, demonstrated that not only are women credit worthy, but they're responsible and they invest back in their families. For every $100 that a woman earns, she spends 90 cents back on education, healthcare, and nutrition. So from those two small rooms, eventually over a decade, we were able to grow to 300,000 clients, dispersing $200 million with a recovery rate of 98%. Also, from those two small rooms and seven staff members, we eventually reached out to 2,000 employees, changing their lives. And there are hundreds of stories of women who I came across who started from simply starting and selling small things from their home to now setting up micro-enterprises and employing women within their communities. After this journey, I had the opportunity to go for my master's to the Kennedy School and take a back seat, not running uh, an enterprise anymore, and really, as we say at, uh, in the course that I took, adaptive leadership, going on the balcony, reflecting on, uh, upon my experiences, the successes, but also the challenges, the failures. And I got to learn about my own blind spots, my own uh, triggers, and how I could become more effective. Often when we look at leadership, especially in our part of the world, we associate leadership with titles and big positions. But I learned from my class on adaptive leadership that anyone can exercise leadership. You can be anywhere in the system and you be can begin now. But you need partners, you need allies, and you need to constantly be in action and reflect on the balcony. So after this experience, I ended up in Dubai uh, with my husband, and I was faced with a new challenge, reinvention. And I realized reinvention, while it sounds very fun and exciting, is actually quite messy, confusing, and disorienting. I didn't know where to begin. I realized that so much of my own identity was linked with my work as a microfinance entrepreneur, and I didn't have that anymore and I had no clue about where to begin and where to start. And I'm sure you would agree with me that Dubai is not about micro-lending. It's really about big things. So I had to think about how I could be meaningful in the region and in the space. And I started by running small experiments and then running leadership programs for women, helping them find their voice, create networks, helping entrepreneurs come together, women in the workforce, to think big. The idea being, how can we have more women in positions of authority and influence as role models? Because we know now that it's good for business. 
Diversity boosts your bottom line. There is data by McKinsey Catalyst that shows that return on equity goes up. In fact, if you have women on your boards, you are bound to serve your customers better, understand their needs, and have a longer-term perspective. So I founded a new enterprise called Circle, and our aim is really to create opportunities for companies to hire more women, to bring women in their supply chains, to bring women on boards, and at the same time to work with women and girls from underserved communities on technology and using technology as a lever, as a power for transformation and for them to plug into the economy. McKinsey calculates global gender parity would add $28 trillion to the GDP. That's huge. Countries like UAE, Pakistan, and many others have huge gains to make if we have more women working with us, along us, and also as our leaders. However, we have a long way to go. Does anyone, would anyone like to guess how many years would it take for us to achieve gender parity? 30? 170, very pessimistic. <laughs> 30 is very optimistic. Well, actually, you know, it will take 100 years. This is the estimate by World Economic Forum that if we continue at the pace that we are continuing, it will take us 100 more years to achieve gender parity. I'm sure all of you would not like to wait for 100 years for your daughters, for your granddaughters to really get a seat on the table and to be really bringing all their full potential to the table. And that is what we are changing through our work in Elevate. We are mobilizing stakeholders like private sector, government, and social sector companies to pledge to increase women's employment, not just as frontline workers, but as I said, bringing women on leadership. So my message today from my own journey of working both at the bottom of the pyramid and seeing the power of transformation that women bring in their families, in their communities and society is really that one, when you're working towards change, start with small experiments. Change is often overwhelming when we think of big changes, but if we think of small experiments, learn through those, bring agility, adaptability, we proceed further. Secondly, don't do it alone. Build partners. And there are two kinds of partners that we need. We need partners within our entities, our startups, our enterprises, and those are allies. And then we need partners who are outside our system, who we call confidants. People who you can really have a heart-to-heart -heart talk as an entrepreneur, as an activist, because there are days when the journey is really challenging, and you need to pour your heart out. But you need to do it with the people who you can trust who can also question you and challenge you and, uh, to think big, to dream big, and to do things that maybe you don't even imagine you could do. So having those partners has been very important for me, and having those uh, confidants. Third, as I shared with you, the idea of going on the balcony. Often we're so caught up in action. Imagine like a dance, when you're dancing, or you say you're playing a sport, all you see is the people who are right there in your bird view but you've got to take a bigger view. And you've got to see how are various stakeholders responding to your initiative. Who is really your, uh, you know, who's supporting you, who's engaging, who's excited, and who is not? And how can you bring those in also? And which are the deviant voices who also need to be included? So going on the balcony and jumping back on the dance floor, how can you as an entrepreneur play that game to really move your mission forward? Thank you so much.